And we are live. All right. Thanks, Kira. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chair Anna Priest Knight. I actually officially changed my name yesterday. So uh, we can make record of that on my very last meeting of SACI. <laughs> Um, I would like to welcome you all to the Sustainability Advisory Committee on Energy and Environment. This is our November meeting of 2022. All committee members and staff are participating virtually. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the city's front page website and also linked on our committee's page. And we have an option for the public to listen by phone. And for those of you who are out there with us today, welcome. I'll now go through and introduce all the committee members who are participating virtually. Please make sure to unmute your microphone to say hello. Um, actually, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna wait and do that for... Now, I guess we, do we have to do a roll call? Sorry, everyone. I'm, I have super brain fog today. We've already done that, haven't we, Kira? Technically. I do not think you have to do a roll call introductions. Yeah, I think okay. we voting that, on the minutes. The, uh, the meeting minutes, maybe. Correct. Maybe. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So let's uh, go to the first item on the agenda, which is approval of last month, September, last meetings minutes, which is from September. Has everyone had the opportunity to review the minutes? And is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Tim. I'll second I'll it, Anna. You'll second Anne. Was there any discussion or any changes to the minutes? You can make that at this time. Okay. Now I'll do a roll call to see who is in favor of approving the minutes. Anne? Aye. Kim? Aye. Maggie? Might not be present. Tim? Aye. Michael? Don't see him present either. Chris? Aye. Steve? Aye. Allison? Aye. And I myself is also approved with an aye. Minutes pass. Okay, um, one thing to note, there was a September public comment that was missed. Um, we just need to let you all know that that public comment is available to you to review. Um, there's a link on the agenda for you to review that. Apologies for those who were affected by that. Obviously, we are still working through technical difficulties. Um, okay. Kira, was there any public comment for this meeting, however? There was not any public comment. Okay, great. All right, let's move on to item number two on the agenda, which is update and reports. Kira is going to update us on the sustainability staff and the memo. Great, thanks everybody. I hope that you had a chance to review the memo. It's linked in the agenda here, and I'm just gonna give you some very quick highlights and happy to answer any questions about any of the items that were highlighted here. Um, we talked a little bit about the food scraps drop off. We're just celebrating one year of public opportunity to do to participate in the food scrap program. We've diverted 193,000 pounds or 132 tons at the four public opportunity sites so far with the newest one opening in West Asheville just this fall. So excited about that program's evolution and the move towards operationalizing that here in the city and the county. Um, Single-use plastics. Um, I think most of you are aware that at the October 11th meeting, Council directed the sustainability staff to continue um, to do public engagement 
um, in a two-phased approach. So sort of took our recommendation to move forward with the leaf bag ordinance update. So that's an internal update and that will go back to council for approval at the January 10th meeting. So that moves to um, remove plastic leaf bags from, from the system and allowing paper bags or reusable containers for curbside leaf collection within the city. And then we're launching our external and internal engagement, um, currently focusing on city staff through the end of the year, and then moving forward with external stakeholder engagement with a public survey launch in February to inform a recommendation to council next year around single use plastics reduction. Um, so looking forward to that ongoing engagement. And finally, with the Municipal Climate Action Plan, y'all have been quite involved with that. So thank you for your work there to date. Um, the project page is up to date. We do have our first draft in hand. So we're excited to be reviewing that with our departmental partners across the city. Um, there will be an opportunity for SACI to review a draft in January and um, committee specific opportunities to engage with that um, and continue to offer feedback as we move towards a draft um, or a final report, I should say, going to council for adoption in February of next year. So continuing to move that project along, happy to answer any questions, provide additional input, and then we'll also direct folks who are listening and the committee back to the memo that is included in the agenda. Steve, you have a question? You're muted. Life. Zoom life. It fails. It never fails. It never fails. Um, I have a number of questions, actually. Um, uh, just to um, inf really information uh, gathering on the, um, I guess to start start with the MCAP, you said you had a first uh, draft in hand. Uh, does that mean that first draft in your hands only, or is there a one available? It is in our hands currently. We're doing internal review. We just received it. So we're working through um, kind of working that in our departmental stakeholders by high input activity. So the intention with that plan is to, um, we have two rounds of, of input to, with the consultants on drafts that are happening through the end of the calendar year, and then we'll move to graphics. And so um, looking forward to, I think there is a climate Resilience Working Group review um, with the SACI Climate Resilience Working Group on the calendar in December. And that's the primary opportunity. And then it will come back to SACI for a review in our January meeting. So a draft will be available for us generally to take a look at into sometime in December? Through working groups. Okay. Um, I, I understand there are open meeting restrictions on discussion and the like, but will the draft be available for every everybody? Kira, I don't think it's going to be available until January. To Stacy, To yes. Stacy as a group, that's yes. correct. There is an opportunity at the working group level for working groups to um, review the draft. I can't tell you exactly when because I don't know where that fits into the timeline, but Yes, but a draft will come to the larger body in the, the January public meeting. Yes. Kira, I wasn't aware that all the work groups were going to have. I thought just the uh, resilience work group was reviewing it. Are you saying all the work groups are? Because that's not something I, I knew. I know that the climate resilience working group has scheduled a meeting. To the right. best of my knowledge, that's the current one that that's has been one. scheduled. But I believe there there may be opportunity for the energy working group as well. I'm not sure that meeting has been scheduled. Okay, so sometime December, January, this draft will become some draft will become public and we'll be able to have input. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I oh sorry. No, speak. I'm oh, sorry. Steve, uh, uh, this is Michael Totten. I'm, I have to dial in uh, this time, so I don't know how to break my hand on a phone call. Uh, but I just wanted to reinforce with Steve. Steve and I both are on the Energy Committee, and there's we have so much discussion about climate, so I certainly hope there's no lost opportunities um, for getting involved early as we can to uh, see and review it. Yeah, this is a this is a um, I mean this is an important 
undertaken document. Now, everybody, I think, not, not even just the energy group, all of us, I think, should be and will be in, uh, engaged when the opportunity arises. That was I was just asking about timing. Uh, food scraps, quest, a few questions. Um, uh, memo says 1,900 households. Uh, was that right? Which I calculate to be, uh, given the other numbers, about 100 pounds of scraps per household per year. Um, is that, are these numbers a lot or a little? How do you measure success? Um, how, how much does the program cost? What are the prospects for expansion? I have question on question, but as you wish. Yeah. Um, so far, we're really impressed with the community. That is definitely a lot. I mean, we don't, the way that we're collecting data to date is through registration data. So we're not able to exactly correlate the households that are actually participating versus those that registered. So presumably that means some of those households are providing less than that and some are providing more than that in terms of their diversion. Um, but to your your broader question around how are we measuring success and how are we planning for expansion in the future, that we're the current phase, so we've been in two pilots, basically. The first one was, will this work at all? Will anyone drive their food scraps around? Let's open one at Stevens Lee and see how it goes. Raging success. People, it turns out, are willing to drive their food scraps around. Pilot two is, what does this look like as an expansion? So Stevens Lee was a lot of infrastructure, a larger shed. Um, so we thought, okay, we want this to be more neighborhood based. What does it look like if we if we bring the footprint down a little, make it an easier opportunity to install in places that don't have the same setup as Stevens Lee? And so second phase pilot in partnership with the county and funded through the NCDEQ was to install smaller ones like the one that is um, presently at West Asheville Library and the Oakley Recreation Center. And those have been successful. So we're currently in phase three, which coming back to your question, is where we think about how to operationalize both the existing um, pilot programs and also think about continuing to strategize with the county around expansion. What does that look like? How do we get to the four corners from our perspective, the four corners of the city and have it really be a neighborhood-based initiative and better being able to calculate and articulate return on investment in terms of who can access them, um, how, how much diversion is this really contributing to, and how does it fit within the wider conversation of waste reduction, which is where yeah. it becomes relevant to the goals that we're operating underneath and to the goals of this committee. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to those yet, but we're, we're looking to translate what we do know in terms of how we have been collecting data into some um, wider trends and to be able to extrapolate on that data to make better planning decisions as we operationalize. I must say this all sounds great, and I'm I'm you will think ill of me, but I uh, I'm I'm quite surprised that the uh, that there's been such apparently good participation. Um, I I would have imagined, and it reveals my own personal bias that driving food scraps around would not be high on my list of adding things to do, uh, just because not because I wouldn't want to, but just because of the having another yet another thing to do. Um, and um, and so convenience, I think, is clearly um, you know the the ticket to getting this thing uh, uh, really amped up and the like. Has there been there haven't been any hasn't been any discussion with I know there's a private organization that will come to your house right and you pay a fee and they'll bring it bring back uh, 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 dirt for you to use in your garden that sort of thing. Has there been any? It probably not maybe premature to even think about, uh, talk about some kind of public-private collaboration that could, you know, that could make uh, this thing super convenient for people if they could just leave it out uh, without may maybe paying the, paying the fee. I don't know. I just throw that out there. I don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly be, this is one piece of the puzzle and how do we divert organics because we know that we have to meet people where they are um, and, and figuring out what's the right fit for some people. And so we have for many years emphasized with city operations, supporting people in backyard composting. I feel like we've really made strides there, offering instruction, offering resources, 
And so this was sort of the next iteration of, well, we know people live in multifamily housing. We know people are concerned about bears. We understand there are people who really want to compost but can't. And so that's sort of the next step. I think as we continue yeah. to think about addressing as many audiences as possible and, you know, the largest um, return on investment or, or carbon calculation would include less vehicle miles traveled with your food scraps, right? So if you could yeah. walk it or bike it, then it's the it's the best equation. So yeah. I think there's a combination of thinking about when do we really max out on the people willing to move their food scraps around at all, and then what is it? What are what are the next phase options look like, and how do we bring it to more people? And I think there's a lot of ways that that conversation might go over time. Allison, do you have your hand up? Yeah, some um, current members of SACI may not remember that we did a curbside compost study, feasibility study back five or seven years ago, the city did. So there there already has been some good work, good groundwork done. Good. I didn't live here then. Tim. Yeah, I was curious, are businesses allowed to drop off food scraps or is it just re residents? The current program is a residence only program from a capacity and kind of capture um, standpoint. So that's definitely a big sector that is not addressed through this opportunity. There are private haulers that service um, restaurants and, and retailers in our community currently, but we know that that's a hole in the, in the bigger picture in, in the long run. Thanks. I have one single use plastics question. Super. Can you can you just um, if you if you guys have focused I had time to focus on it yet, which um, in getting the public feedback that you're the that you're starting you're about your big I guess you can start in February or something. Yeah, to do that. My my question is who do you, who which groups do you plan to focus on? Uh, in particular, I, I would think that. Uh, small businesses and even large businesses that may be effect, affected by this and how it would affect their business and timing of implementing this thing. I, I hope that that's high priority on, on the list of getting, uh, getting feedback. Yeah, definitely. And I will say that we're not starting from zero. You know, this um, ordinance came forward from the Plastic Free WNC Coalition, and there has been some initial engagement work done with uh, restaurants and retailers. And also we recognize the need to do more of that. So part of what we're doing with our first round of internal <laughs> engagement is is doing um, talking to our colleagues here in the city and, and understanding where those connections currently live and how we can leverage that in order to get out specifically into the business community, underserved communities of residents, and really understanding how what the impacts are, positive, negative, known, unintended, to really flesh out a bigger picture of what, what it would look like to roll out um, any kind of plastics reduction initiative um, going forward. So certainly business, especially small business impact is, is an important audience, just figuring out how to get that feedback. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments on staff memo? Thank you, Kira. Awesome yeah. update. Three, unfinished business. Three A, approval of the 2022 annual report. Thank you all so much for um, getting your sections of the annual report in in a timely manner. That was super helpful for us this year to, to get that together. Um, we're in no uh, risk of missing the deadline this year like we did last year. So we're, we're good to go. Um, we will need to approve the report. Uh, we can go ahead and do a motion in a second and then do the discussion if there were any edits that anyone wanted to make at that time. So um, let me know if, if anyone would like to make a motion to approve. I'll motion to approve. Thank you, Kim. Would anyone like to second? I'll second. Yeah. Michael Quick Simon. question. If there is discussion, I think we should move through the discussion. If there are any updates or changes, we'll want to approve the report with 
right up, updates and changes. So I think we should have the discussion before we move to approve the report. Yeah, I think that's fine. We could do it that way. Sometimes we just do a motion and then we do the discussion and then we do amend the motion. Amend the motion. Yeah. So okay. either way works for me. But I did hear Michael second. Yeah, so now we can right. open it up for a discussion. If anyone has any edits to the report. I don't. I thought it looked great. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for your edits early on in the process, too. That was helpful. Y'all are going to make this easy on us. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's because I mean, we already did of... the editing, Anna. That's I why. know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's got a lot of great information. So great. I think it's wonderful. Okay, cool. Well, then I'll go down the list of attendees to see if we are in favor of approving. Um, Ann Keller. I just want to say one thing, Anna. In rereading the bylaws, I noticed that it says you have to do it in alphabetical order by last name. But we can skip it now. Just saying, after all these years, I noticed that. Wow. Uh, I. <laughs> I can't think that fast. We need to put them in alphabetical order on the agenda next time. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go in the same order I did earlier. Kim? Aye. Maggie? I don't think she has shown up yet. Tim? Aye. Michael? Aye. Chris? Aye. Steve? The alphabetical solution is achieved by changing the bylaws. Aye. <laughs> I vote aye. Okay, I. Steve. <laughs> uh, Allison? Aye. And I also vote aye. The annual report passes. Thank you all so much. Next item on the agenda, 3B, is the approval of the chair and vice chair. We gave you all a heads up at the retreat in September. Was that in September? Whenever that retreat was, that uh, both Anne and I, chair and vice chair, respectively, will be rolling off next month. So Tim... Orman and Steve Barron have volunteered to take on these roles respectively. Tim in the position of chair, Steve in the position of vice chair. Um, if anyone else would like to toss their name in the hat, feel free to speak up at this time or during the discussion portion of this uh, vote. Um, would anyone else like to volunteer? I think the two that have would be wonderfully fit for the role. <laughs> I Thank agree. You. Thank you. Okay, so we will need a motion to approve the um, nomination of chair and vice chair, as stated previously. I'll motion to approve. Thank you, Chris. Anyone want to second? I'll second, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Okay. Any further discussion? Anyone else would like to? Do they know everything that's required, Anna? They might want to rethink. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Could you tell us the salary again, Anna? <laughs> I think later on in this agenda, I think there's an opportunity for them to rewrite the bylaws. Isn't that it's right? True. Yeah. <laughs> the salary usually consists of a free bus pass. <laughs> I think we all get that. And uh, free tickets to the uh, basketball game or something like that. <laughs> okay, I'll do, um, I'll go down the roll call again and not in alphabetical order. <laughs> and uh, yes, I'm in favor of Tim and Steve taking those positions. Thank you. Kim. Yes, I think that's a great choice. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're allowed to vote for yourself, but maybe you can vote for the other person, Tim. Yes, I vote for Steve. 
<laughs> Michael. Yes. Great Chris. Phrases. Thanks. Chris. Yes. Aye. Steve. Aye for Tim. Allison. Aye. And I also vote aye. Congratulations, Tim and Steve. We look forward to passing the baton on to you two. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number four on the agenda is new business. 4A is the discussion and an update to the bylaws. Ann. Yes. Uh, everybody had an opportunity to review the bylaws. Um, I feel like we did this a few years ago, but can't remember exactly when. And I don't know that it says it anywhere. That would be another nice thing to add, Kira, as I'm thinking about it. At the bottom of it is put the uh, the date last, and maybe it's down there somewhere. I just don't remember. Ah, yes, but not there. Oh, see, we don't know when it was. That would be nice to have typed at the bottom. Anyway, it's been a while. At the very least, it's been a few years. Before COVID, before that, so three or four years ago, probably, at the most. Um, and what we wanted to do was to go through and look and see if there's anything that needed adjusting um, or anyone had things they wanted to comment or question about. Um, so uh, those of you that have already seen it, you can see there are several different questions and comments that were made here. Um, I'll just say the ones I made, I, um, I started reading it and realized that right away at the very at the very top, it says Sustainability Advisory Committee for Energy and the Environment. At the very top of the page, you can't see it right now, but it, there. And then down here in this first paragraph, it show, it's, it's reduced to Sustainability Advisory Committee. And I started thinking about that. Isn't that interesting? And is that a, maybe a more appropriate description, which doesn't name any particular aspect, just all of sustainability? That can include anything from green infrastructure to flooding resilience to energy to scra table scraps, any of that stuff. And that's why I wondered if it might not be a good idea and ask the question uh, to drop those particular terms. I think Steve you know, had another idea that it was good to call those out. Um, but I, I started with it because there it is in, in the actual bylaws where it's dropped. So are there any thoughts about that? I have some. But I, I've deferred anybody. I, I've, I've indicated a few in the, in the, uh, in the comments here and I can, I can, uh, I can speak to that if you wish or or defer to others who want to comment at this point. Let's just see if anybody who hasn't written anything has a comment, Steve. Anybody else have any yeah. thoughts about the title of the... Now, just to clarify, too, uh, Kira looked for us and, and was told that we can approve changes to our bylaws uh, ourselves, That not, but I think the title of the com commission, committee, whatever it, it is, depending on where you, who you're talking about has to be approved by city council because of the ordinance that um, or the um, resolution that named us. So that part we would have to send back to city council to approve. But anyway, does anyone have any thoughts about the name? Does it matter? Does it not matter? Um, what are your thoughts? I would say that anytime you can reduce the number of acronyms and letters within an acronym is kind of nice. Um, you know, for that reason alone, I'd support it. I think Sustainability Advisory Committee is broad enough to include almost anything we talk about um, or have interest in. So I would support it. Um, I think the broad public also understands that sustainability is broad as well. They, you know, the only reason not to would be energy and environment is specific, um, but I don't, I don't think it is enough to keep it, in my opinion. Yeah, and Chris, I think one of the things that happened way back in the day when it started, what was that, 2007 or 8, there was a huge emphasis on energy reduction. And Maggie Ullman, who was the sustainability 
manager, I think I, that might've been the title at the time, um, was very big on getting funding to do a lot of energy use reductions uh, by the city and all over the, you know, street lights and schools. And it was a big effort and they made a lot of progress. Um, so I think that might've been initially the big focus of the effort. So that was another piece that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Any other comments besides Steve? I have a question, Ann. Yeah, sure, Tim. Do you think the way it stands now that there are some gaps, like say with regard to community issues, community resilience, that that may be confusing by limiting it to energy and environment? Or? I think it, 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 yeah, it just stood out to me that it was like, yeah, it, it's, why do we call that out? Why should we call food scraps out or, you know, any of these other things we focus on? It seemed to me that naming it as opposed to just leaving the whole big umbrella was, was a little bit off. And I do think it's from history. I think that was the big thing at the time. You were probably aware of it at the time. Mm -hmm. So it might be. Yeah, I think if it's beneficial to drop it, then we should consider it. And um, if it doesn't really have a bearing on our scope, then maybe keep it the same. I so agree. That, I think it's a. Uh, I think we we do a, a broad scope, and 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 keeping that open is is a good idea. Um, if it's an easy change, go for it. Thank you. Anyone else? Steve, you want to pop in now? Yeah, everybody beat up on me. They didn't well, even know it, but they did. That's good. You need I it. No, I know. You must have been right. You must be right, Ann. Um, <laughs> but uh, let me let me just say a, a few a uh, few little things here. Um, uh, uh, one is on your. If you could scroll where it's where Ann was pointing out uh, a little up above from where it's showing now that it just talks about sustainability. I mean, I, I think that, I mean, the parenthetical is SACI, right? Uh, and and the, the, the uh, name SACI does come, as Anne indicated, directly from the resolution which created uh, this committee. So if there's an important reason to go back to the uh, city council and say, we need to broaden things, I'm all for it because I don't think we should be restricted on sustainability issues. Having having said that, you know, food scraps, all the other things that I have seen that we've been doing, uh, really can come under the rubric of environment uh, as well as energy. Uh, and I don't see that we are, uh, as Tim indicated, um, uh, or or Tim on the on the on the one side of it. I don't think that we have been restricted by this and or are restricted by having the uh, reference to energy and the environment uh, on it. So, um, you know, these are just words. We're going to, we're going to continue to do what we need to do. Um, if you, I don't see that we are actually restricted in any way as a practical matter. So this is um, uh, maybe much ado about not very much. Um, the one other minor thing I'd say is that on an Article Three purpose, uh, and where you had indicated um, after after suggesting we shouldn't we should only reference uh, sustainability, you had inserted environmental sustainability, and if we're going to do that, I think we we should go back to including energy and environmental sustainability. That's in the first line of Article Two purpose. Uh, I think that that's just, I don't yeah, that's I don't just, think I meant to do that. So anyway. All right. I think that anyway. was the, I don't know where that, I, I was cutting, correcting sustainability. And that's what I did, environmental sustainability, because they had sustainable principles. That's a wrong term. It's a bad word. It doesn't make sense. You don't have sustainable principles. So I was correcting the sustainable principles to make it accurate. It's not that. Right. Okay. I was just that's focusing on from. adding environmental. In any event, you know, bottom line for me is this doesn't, I, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's going to change what we do one way or the other. Uh, if we, if it, people feel that we want to go back to city council and ask them to allow us to change our name, fine. 
Uh, I don't think it's, I wouldn't do it. I don't think we need to, but I'm, I'm good. Speaking um, from my perspective, from someone who has to do, you know, a fair bit of public engagement with our name, I rarely introduce myself as a member of SACI because nobody knows what that means. And more often, I introduce myself as a member of the Sustainability Advisory Committee and even more often do not ever add on verbally <laughs> energy and environment just because it's so cumbersome. Yeah, so, it is long. You're right. That's long to describe. Yeah. So as Tim and Steve, as you find yourselves having to speak on behalf of this committee, you may find it more easier to introduce yourselves as the Sustainability Advisory Committee. So just something else to think about. Yeah. Allison? I also want to concur. Um, I think that even when I, you know, first moved here and heard about this, I was like, really? Is it just energy? And for to a time, it did focus a lot of energy only. Um, but I do, I agree with Chris that simplicity is good. Um, and it, it, it is kind of a mouthful to say sustainability advisory committee on energy and the environment, you know, like people it, have already stopped listening before you get exactly to the right. end. That's exactly right. So <laughs> that's my vote. Any other comments? Um, I guess because we have to go through this little by little, there's only, there's not that many. I don't know that we're going to have this much conversation about the rest of them, but do we need to decide as a group? I don't know. Do we need to vote? Um, Kira, do you think that, and, and Anna, the best way to do it is to get a vote on this particular part? I'd say we do it all at once at the end. But how are we going to separate? Okay, so are we going to, are we proposing to drop the energy and environment piece out of here? We have to know what we're going to vote on at the end. That's why I was asking. Because there's yeah. going to be other comments, other questions as we go farther down. There'll be other things to agree or disagree about. Haven't we done it in the past where we kind of, someone's taking notes, perhaps Kira, and we can agree to it based on the notes that Kira took? That's what, what I'm asking, that? Chris. And we could do that at the end? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Are we yes or no on changing it? That has to be written down so we yeah. can go for, forward and then in the end we can vote. That's what I'm getting at. So yep. are we, we don't want, otherwise we're going to have to vote on every topic. That's what I was getting at. So do we, do people think we should take the last part of the of the name out and just leave it SAC? That's the question. Is that what we're going to vote on? We can do an informal vote right now and then do the formal vote at the end. If you want to do it that way. Just yeah, like, we just need yeah, to figure like, out a way to separate each of these because yeah. there's not going to be agreement on every single one of them. I think we have to clarify what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. So those who think it'd be a good idea to drop the last part of this of the name and we go to city council and hopefully that's not a big deal. If they say no, it will survive. But uh, mm -hmm. who wants who thinks we should go ahead and um Remove energy in the environment. Aye. 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 I'm going to be a good team player. Aye. Okay, so we're going to drop. That's what we'll vote on later is just changing it to SAC. Okay, thank you. Anybody, Anybody? any days in there? One, and just... Uh, and that I take it if that happens, that would include uh, deleting uh, the first line under purpose, energy and environmental. And it would just say sustainability. Is that correct? Yeah, it's environmental. The, again, what I was doing, Steve, if you read that without my changes in there is in integrating sustainable yeah. principles, which makes no sense to me. This happens all the time. There are sustainable principles have nothing to do necessarily with sustainability. They're principles that you can sustain. So I was correcting what I see as a wrongly written sentence. So we just have to, that's why I changed it that way. Mm -hmm. So you, that's we why did. I put it in, you can rewrite it, but I'm just saying in integrating sustainability principles, we can take the energy and environment out if you want, just put sustainability okay. principles. Right. That's what I was. That's what right. I. There are a lot of different kinds of sustainability. Yeah. So, right. You know. Right. 
Take them out. That's that's what I understood the, the consensus to be. Thanks. There's money, sustainability, there's whatever. But yeah, we can take all that out and just use sustainability. Great. Um, so that leads to the next one. Well, I'm just writing that down, sustainability principles. Um, that would be what we would change it in integrating sustainability principles into city operations uh, through the following activities. And then those were written down. Again, these are small edits just to make it more accurate as a or better written or whatever the phrase might be. Um, okay, so we're going to go. While you're doing that, I'll add that just because we're talking about changing our name doesn't mean we remove the words energy and environment from anything below it. You know, we're still going to be doing it. And I think it's actually good to include those words because they're tag words. And, you know, just because it's not in our name doesn't mean we can't mention it as our purpose, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't know where else it is in there, to be honest with you. Um, but Mm -hmm. But sure, I mean, I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, okay, so Kira, are you making all the other? I saw you edited. You're going to take the comments out or accept them or whatever, and then we can move on. Yes, I'm working through that. Or just move on and we can take the comments out later, maybe. And, and what will our nickname be? <laughs> Don't yeah. Say it, don't say it. SAC. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, SAC. Yes. And Bridget uh, made these comments. She did not want it to be stipulated as on July first each year. I think that's originally, well, maybe is was because of um, the city's calendar in July, but uh, she thought it would be better because people get off at different times. Like we're getting off in Jan in uh, December that it was better just to have for one year um, from the time they were elected. Does anybody have any problem with that? No? no. Okay. No. Okay, let's go on down then. These the rest of these are similarly small. Again, once annually um, sets the meeting schedule. That makes a lot of sense to me and then we all know what it's what it's going to be. Can, Any can problems? Ask, has there ever been a secretary? I, I saw that that's mentioned. In the, um, the secretary is Kira and Bridget. Okay. They've all right. always been. That's what the in there it says something by the city the city manager, and they are the appointees. Okay. Um, and she changed it from nine regular meetings to six to at least six. So that if we went every other month, that would meet the requirement. If we go, if we have more than that, that's fine too. Any issues with that, anybody? Okay. No. Uh, okay, we're done with that and that. Oh, there was a comment in there that said something about, oh, by these rules. And I wondered what these rules were. So I just corrected it and said in these bylaws, unless there's some otherwise provided for in these bylaws, Robert's rules will, will govern all points of order and procedure. Any issues? Sounds good to me. Okay. All righty. Oh, you skipped that. There you go. Um, Steve, uh, oh, this was a conversation here about whether if you have a some kind of conflict of interest or something that you would make it clear um, at the start of the meeting that you were going to recuse yourself from voting because you had a conflict of interest. Uh, I think Steve's thought was that you should still be allowed to participate in the discussion because your point of view might have merit. Um, and so that's 
I think the rewriting that that you did here, right, Steve? You wanna you wanna add some some words around that? Uh, I think that's basically it. Um, I the important, very important thing it seems to me is that uh, if people have a financial or other personal interest in a matter, that it be disclosed up front. Um, up front, it seems to me doesn't need necessarily need to be at the beginning of the meeting as a whole. It could be at the just before discussion of the particular agenda item, uh, if not before. Uh, but um, I, I, in my uh, experience, uh, when Folks have seem to have something of a uh, of an interest in something. Having disclosed it, they nonetheless may have something useful to bring to the discussion table. And we ought not to cut off, uh, you know, everything on the table about uh, about what the pros and cons of various uh, actions. Uh, that's been my experience. Uh, with, of course, the important uh, restriction that once things are discussed after having expressed. Uh, where you're coming from, uh, you can't vote on the matter. So I think it's helpful to allow that flexibility for discussion. I will say that I understand this is a little slightly different, but it is food for thought. I understand that the state legislature passed a law recently that says no elected official can advocate for or vote on any particular budget item, they can vote on the big picture budget, but not for anything that they had personal connections with. Um, and this is a little different, but I think it has that same, you know, there's that part of it in there that as to whether, I, I don't know what I, I don't know how I feel about it, Steve. So I'm just throwing that in there. It was that restriction on legislators that they they couldn't vote. It was a, a vote restriction, or was it you can't participate in? You cannot advocate meetings. for or vote on, and it's all elected officials, from my understanding, throughout the state, um, that you cannot do that for anything that you have any, you know, conflict of interest with or special affinity for, whatever the right you know term is that lawyers would use. So this is a little different from that because we're not elected. Um, right. So I'm just throwing that out there. There, and I don't. I don't know what the rest of y'all think at all. Anybody have any concerns or questions about that? No, I support this change. I like the idea that Steve mentioned about being able to participate um, in a discussion, um, but just not be able to vote. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts? The change sounds reasonable to me. I'm not sure if there are any precedents legally or, you know, some kind of case history that would preclude um, discussion, but it sounds reasonable. Okay. Any other input? Okay. I guess uh, we're going to go with Steve's edits. On the uh, and on the um, if you, I don't is that oh if there's more if there's more I, there, I, if you scroll up just for a moment to um, uh, just our, on the uh, roll call, maybe we actually can get rid of that last sentence there. <laughs> it does seem kind of silly. <laughs> it's silly. <laughs> well, of, we haven't out. been doing it because none of us knew it. We never paid attention to it. Yeah. Anybody have a problem with that? Not at all. Okay. Go for it, Kira. <laughs> how about reverse alphabetical? Never mind. <laughs> how, alter, how about alternating? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You may want to leave that portion about the chair being last, though. <clears throat> I mean, that's kind of a one benefit to being the chair. You get to beat the tiebreaker sometimes. Hmm. Is that the one or one of the many? <laughs> one or of the it could be that you you don't want to sway the vote because of your importance. That's true. That as well. Yeah, I like the idea of keeping that in there. Chair voting last. We just make it more complicated for you, Kira. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
All right. We're making headway here. See, that's, that's, this may be where you were talking about, Chris, but see, that seems out of place to me now. I'm in the middle of it to mm -hmm. name energy and the environment in particular. I see what you're saying. So we might need to rewrite that sentence. Mm -hmm. Well, putting a period after sustainability. There's, there's at least one other place I yes. noticed as we were scrolling down that had also had reference to energy environment. Uh, I don't. Yeah, Kira, you could go life. back uh, to achieve for achieving and maintaining sustainability. And just take the rest of it out, like you said. <clears throat> Where was the other part, Steve, that you were mentioning? Oh, back under, way up, sort of under education, one of the functions. I think as you some scroll down, I noted that there was reference to edu uh, environment and energy. I saw that too. It's on the first page. Yeah. Right there, in education. Oh, Increasing awareness of sustainability. Of Just take out energy and environmental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Increase awareness of sustainability issues by developing. As an what idea. If what if it's not issues? Well, then why are we talking about it? Because <laughs> you're trying to get to it. <laughs> you're trying to achieve yeah. it. Yeah. Topics. Topics. Saying. Yep. Topics. Yes. Nailed it. Okay. Cool. Do we ever, is sustainability ever defined here? Don't go there, Steve. Don't go <laughs> there. Sorry. I'm the sorry. attorney is, is climbing the important out thing of is have a short. The important thing is overriding concerns have a short name. I understand. I guess we'll have to fix that the name up there too at some point, Kira, before we finish. But go ahead and we're almost done. I think we just need to go through a few more at the bottom. Yeah, well, there maybe were, that was it. There were a couple more, three and four, and in, in the. Oh, there um, were. Okay. Yeah, if you go up right there, and powers and duties, and powers and calls duties. out both energy and environment, environmental. Uh huh. Yeah. Delete that. Just take it out. Same with number four. It's kind of repeating something we already saw up there anyway, the whole that whole thing, but that's okay. That's <clears throat> part of our authority. Is that it pretty much? Except for the title? Anybody see something else we missed? Nope. So I do have a recommendation and chatting over here with Ben um, because of the process implications of the name change. I recommend that we don't change it in the bylaws. It could be a recommendation for pursual, but if we want to approve the bylaws, we should not approve the bylaws with a new name that is not yet gone through process. Okay. So think if we want to make a motion today on all the other changes, we should not update the name and there can be a recommendation for this body to pursue a name change through appropriate channels as a se separate initiative. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let me ask a question. Do we, ultimately the council needs to approve the name change, right? That's what she just said. Yeah. Right. And, and if the council needs, to, should should these other changes which follow from to the body, which follow from the name change, should they await 
the uh, city council's uh, approval to change the name. You know, Steve, I don't think that needs to be done because we're, what we're doing is de-emphasizing a particular part of stuff, even if the name didn't change, which I don't see why they would care, honestly. I don't know why they would say, no, we're not changing the name. But I don't think that we should keep it in there uh, pers um, pursuant to them changing the name of the of the um, committee. And then we got to go back through it and fix all of that afterwards. That's just my thought on it. Yeah. Well, the, 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 when, when this is submitted, when the matter is submitted to the council for approval, we could indicate that we made the, these changes to to broaden the scope or whatever it is we're doing. Uh, I, I, I just I don't think I don't care. I'll, I think what we're saying, if I'm not if I'm not misunderstanding Kira and Ben, is that there will be a recommendation through some means. I don't know if Ben does it or somebody else to City Council that we update the name of the committee to just be Sustainability Advisory Committee. We've already updated our bylaws, so we don't even have to say that, I guess. But it just becomes now known as SAC, and they're not going to weigh in on the bylaws otherwise, right, Kira? Yeah, that's right. They they the bylaws are within the purview of this body to amend, but in order to change the name of the committee, it needs to go to a council committee because it would be a revision to an existing resolution is that name revision something that we need to vote on the, the request to the council that we vote on or is that something you take care of uh, Kira? So, i would have to maybe ben you could weigh in yeah, on that or yeah, another process. i'm not gonna have the, not gonna have the specific answer first of all ben woody um assistant city manager thanks for letting me sit in today um and listen to the conversation i think everything that karen ann has said so far is correct um, I will say that in terms of the process for initiating and changing your name, um, what I'll do is, so the, we have a, a board that actually recently did that. So the tree commission, probably about three years ago, went through the process of changing their name to the urban forestry commission. So there is a precedent and an example. So what I would suggest is let Kiera and I go look at how they did that and the steps that were taken, then maybe we can bring that back to you uh, and then just do the same thing to initiate the name change. Because I actually think when they did the name change, they, they may have cleaned up a couple of elements of their enabling ordinance as well. But we can get that process for you. Great. That's great. And so the end of that would be, we would do everything we've already done, get rid of it, clean everything up, and just not change the name on this right now until we have approval from city council. Right. Okay. So Kira, I think you could get rid of these other comments over here on the side. We just wouldn't change the name on the bylaws yet until we have approval, right? So then we have a clean copy. Okay. <clears throat> So I guess where we are now is we've agreed to whatever changes were on there and people edited and so forth. Uh, sometimes things that were proposed and we now have gotten to an agreement that we're happy with this. We're just waiting to update the name of the committee based on city council vote to be taken whenever that is. I don't know when the next opportunity comes, but Ben and Kira will tell us, I guess the next meeting of SACI won't be till January. So maybe there's a chance it could, it seems to me then this would be like a, um, what is, what is it called when you just put it, stick it at the front of the meeting and it's like a, like a consent agenda, a consent item. agenda item. Exactly. I don't, I don't, can't imagine them spending time having this conversation. I don't. And I think now that you say that, I think the UFC change was also a consent item. But we, but we can email that. I mean, here, I would assume we could pull that information together and get an email to the board so you'll have that sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess uh, we have to make a, we have a motion somewhere. Steve, what? One, la one last question. I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understand. The, uh, the last article of the bylaws about uh, when the vote 
at which meeting the vote can be taken to change the bylaws. We can, I just want confirmation that we can make these changes at this meeting and it doesn't have to wait for the next meeting. My understanding, and Ben, correct me if you have a different understanding, but I believe that we have, have to recommend it and officially approve it in January, that this is the notice of change and that we are recommending that we will be voting on it in January, which gives the public opportunity to provide comment at the January meeting. But we wouldn't be making any changes between then and now. We'd be making that approval here and then the official vote to adopt the bylaws would be in January. Good catch, Steve. Okay, is everybody all right with that? And we will also then pursue uh, in Anna and Mai's absence, though, you will continue this and Ben and Kira will do what needs to be done relative to getting the name to the uh, city council, the name change. And I think that might be completed. Is everybody okay now? We're good. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Thanks for all your effort on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. Appreciate you heading that up. Thank you, Anna. You're, I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> Thanks. All right, item 4B on the agenda, Blue Horizons Project, fiscal year 22, contract review. Welcome, Jamie. Uh, the microphone is yours. Would you like me to share my screen or do you wanna hold the mic? I'll be sharing the screen from my end. So if you just want to let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Wine. I've met some of you before, and I've seen some of you on the Blue Horizons Project Community Council. Um, I'm here to give an update as a majority of the funding for Blue Horizons Project and Energy Savers Network, like 65, 75% comes from uh, a contract with the city. The Greenbelt Alliance won a couple of years ago. So the way that they're related, next slide, please. Kara, did you ever, were you ever in elementary school and there was like the teacher would advance it when it went boop? Or was that, was that just me? No? I told that joke to some millennials and they looked at me like I was crazy. They didn't know what I was talking about. I could take yeah, that direction if that's you your preferred old, method. So if that's your preferred indication, I'll take what whatever, you know, whatever indication you want to give, <laughs> I, I can receive. <laughs> so Greenbelt Alliance is a, a local nonprofit. We advance sustainable living um, through a lens of justice, climate justice, and then collaboration and community engagement. So it's a really good fit with the Blue Horizons Project, which is to uh, set the course for clean energy in Buncombe County in 2042. So there's some photos here. The, the top one is a solar install for neighbor to neighbor. And the bottom one is one of our staff here, Hannah, again, doing some caulking. So let's, let's go to the next slide, please. So the Blue Horizons project, I'm, I'm gonna start with Blue Horizons and then I'll talk about Energy Savers Network. Just to kind of re-familiarize -familiar, re all of you about it is the, the it's a group effort and the priorities that have been set are to green the grid, electrify everything, and embrace efficiency. And through those three different core objectives, the people and businesses in Buncombe County and City of Asheville will be able to get to 100% renewable energy. But it takes partnership with all these groups, with it, with the the funding from the county and the city. And then we've got Duke Energy at the table because without them, there's no way we're going to be able to green the grid. Um, and then we do a bunch of outreach, which is what that photo was. So the community council structure is uh, actually three or four committees. The membership committee is more like a task force that they appoint the new members for the following year. And the 100% renewable committee is actually funded. There's a staff position on that by the Candida Foundation. And so that's one of those examples of being able to leverage these city funds to go get additional resources. Um, and then there's the tech committee and the community engagement committee that um, rounded out. Let's go to the next slide, please. So Community Engagement Committee helps set the strategy of where we're going to go and what we're going to do to do engagement. This year, coming out of COVID, we're focusing really hard on being out in the community, going out to festivals and fairs, presenting to community groups. But then we also do a bunch of videos online still for folks that aren't getting out and about. 
And we have uh, one-on-one chats as well with individual people about their specific situation. So this year is really focused on events and community engagement in our talks with the city and internally we're, we're, and, and with the council. It's like, well, we also need to get commercial businesses on board. How do we reach them? What does that look like? Um, and then it's a matter of how do you reach the trades people to switch to um, heat pump uh, HVAC systems. And so, that, so things like that are going to be less of events and community engagement in the future, but that's where we are right now. Next slide, please. The technology committee looks at the technology about how we're going to get there. And the conversations have really focused in on heat pumps and EV infrastructure. And on the EV portion, the Greenville Alliance doesn't work on transportation, really. We focus on energy in the built environment. And so we have a couple of folks um, who are on the uh, Blue Horizons Community Council who work with Land of Sky Regional Council that does a lot of transportation stuff. And so getting them more engaged is one of our, our foci this year uh, into the Blue Horizons projects to make sure that we're leveraging all the resources available. But yeah, there's other options that the Technology Committee is looking at. And the meeting uh, two weeks ago, we looked really deeply at heat pumps and how that would look in the strategic plan. So they, these committees really interplay with each other a lot. Next slide, please. So one of the programs that we do is a custom Zoom session and um, we get folks on the phone and talk about their specific house and then we get them engaged with other resources. These are generally folks who are moderate to high income. A lot of them have already done some green building stuff, but they're trying to make sure they check all the boxes. Um, and this is a, a great way to um, answer people's questions more in depth. The staff here um, that are working on doing the outreach, so Summer and I, I've been talking about going out into these outreach events and having volunteers or other helpers do the outreach piece and like doing live home energy chats at the event so that we can and capture folks' attention right away. Next slide, please. So Neighbor to Neighbor, Neighbor Solar is kicking back off. We've got funding from the city and the county to do 16-ish systems where there's issues with supply chain stuff like everybody else is having. And so it, this number has kind of flexed a little bit depending on uh, what, how big of a system we can install and what's going on with, uh, with the materials costs. But we hired Sugar Hollers, Hollow Solar through a competitive bid. They're a local solar installer. Um, and this uh, photo here is of a, a install at somebody's house. Next slide, please. So Solarize uh, is over from last year. The systems have been installed and it was able to fund a system at the um, beloved Asheville uh, new building. That's the building on the right there. Uh, it's not installed yet. The photo on the left, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. That's from, from Highland Brewery. But the system has, is uh, designed and I'm not sure when it will happen, but any day now. So it's exciting. Next slide, please. We were able to do 180 systems and produce a whole bunch of energy. Um, as you all know, though, this is a drop in the bucket, so we need to keep pushing so we can get as much generation as we can get locally. Next slide, please. So Energy Savers Network is under this is funded uh, primarily by the city, and it's part of the Blue Horizons project. There's like this branding thing, but Greenbelt Horizons is running both, right? So. Energy Savers does low-income upgrades for low-income energy efficiency upgrades, and it actually has some wraparound services that are pretty cool that I'm going to touch on later on um, that uh, provide low-income folks with uh, even more support. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we do free, free home energy upgrades and repairs. We've never charged anybody any money. So um, people initially are like, well, wait a second, is this real? So a lot of our, our leads come from word of mouth. We've done about 500, 850 homes. Um, the There are over 18,000, because we do mobile homes and we do stick built, built homes, there are about 18,000 mobile homes in uh, Buncombe County. So we have a long way to go, but we've got a good start. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> there is a uh, income threshold. You have to be under 200% of federal poverty guidelines. But... Uh, and, separate from the weatherization or different from the weatherization assistance program that's run by community action opportunities. Those are tax dollars coming from the federal government to help low-income folks weatherize a home. They do, um, they have much harder qualification 
and they do a lot deeper work at people's houses, but they only do like 20 or 30. So we're able to serve a lot more people. It's different programs, but we work together to try to serve as many people as we can. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a lot of room for winning on energy efficiency, as y'all probably know. These are the item, things that we do in the house, as to refresh your memory. We do air sealing, so like we'll take the registers off and we'll seal inside the register. But then we also do custom-built storm windows, seal around AC units, weather stripping, things like that. Um, we did have uh, funding from Red Cross to do smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. That has since gone away, but the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors continue to be installed. So that's one of those matching things that Greenbelt Alliance is bringing unrestricted funds because it's important for the program. Next slide, please. So we are, look at all these great numbers. It's always good to put numbers on a slide at 4.40 p.m. As you'll see, things have increased. 2020 was a bit of a blip. Energy efficiency is an in-person thing. So COVID definitely affected it. And in 2021, we, we picked back up and got up to 187 houses. So um, that's very, or it's very exciting. Our 187 metric tons, sorry, homes completed, completed is 143. We actually got up to back 187. So we're, we're gearing back up after COVID. Next slide, please. So this is the leveraging opportunities piece. Um, so the we do a bunch of other stuff uh, that fits into just weatherizing folks' folks's homes. So I already mentioned community action opportunities, and we talked. I talked a bit about neighbor to neighbor solar, but these other ones down here, um, like the Dogwood Health Trust. We were, last year we were able to secure a hundred thousand dollars, and we're hoping to do one hundred twenty five next year to do home repairs in people's homes. So when we get in there, uh, other other places call this pre weatherization doing things that help with indoor air quality, like air sealing, um, like repairing drywall, repairing roof leaks. Uh, there's, as you can see, there's like, we built this bridge to get into this person's house because they had ADA issues. So across the board, just ways to improve people's health at home. It's been really exciting to, to do that because um, it, it improves people's lives much more than just saving on their energy bill. It, it makes them much more comfortable in their home. And it adds dirt to durability to the low income folks um, housing, uh, which is always a problem. It's getting getting repairs done. Duke Energy gives us some money. It's last year it was about eight thousand dollars to pay for some of the incentives that we some of the items that we install, like the water measures and the light bulbs. So we're trying to leverage that money. And tier two energy efficiency is coming out. So that'll be like uh, attic insulation, duct sealing, stuff like that. Um, and so we're trying to. Um, that the dock has been filed with the North Carolina Utility Co Commission, but it hasn't been approved yet. And then the city and county have brought opera funds to the table. Um, that's where we were able to install some solar panels this year. Um, and then there's a HVAC replacement and repair program as well, where we're able to install mini some mini splits, we're able to repair some systems, and we're able to completely replace some low-income folks' HVAC systems. So... It's, that's where the other funding is coming from, is these other programs that are helping provide wraparound services for our clients. Next slide. Is that it? That might be it. Yeah, Questions? That's it. Oh, we're late in the day, so I tried to talk fast. So I'm sorry if it was too fast. But yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I have a quick question, Jamie. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, I think the neighbor to neighbor program, you're targeting 16 systems, I believe. Is that goal for to be spent next year or over the next three or four years? What's that um, timeline like? I think it's in 2024. Okay. So it's over a couple of years. And it's eight systems in Buncombe and eight systems in Asheville City. But we, um, when talking with Sugar Hollow, they could take more up front, so we might be able to get it done sooner than the end of the contract. Great. And with, you know, IRA money coming in, you never know. You want to be ready. Sure. Thanks. Does you have this, Stephen? May I? Yeah. Um, a couple things. Uh, one is I want to, uh, I really want to applaud your uh, community engagement efforts, uh, getting out to events and the like. It's really been amped up in my experience over the last year, and I hope it's, I hope it's uh, yielding some fruit. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you first, 
uh, what, in your opinion, is uh, which which of the Blue Horizon Project specific activities or events have been the most effective this past year? And uh, along with that, what are what do you perceive will are or will be the Blue Horizon Project's top priorities going forward? So I'm I'm not sure about priorities going forward, but we've had some discussions because of the efficacy of some of the, the events or lack thereof. Some of the events have been fantastic. Like uh, we we went to um, like the Honey Festival in June. Honey Festival is bees. Um, and and that was amazing because we talked to a ton of people. People really cared. We went to the Sourwood Festival and it was awful. It was a lot of hours. We didn't have make a lot of connections. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do is sign people up to do Energy Savers Network or Home Energy Chat or get them to do energy efficiency programs that are offered by Duke. Um, but yes, yeah, this hit or miss. And like uh, Goombay Festival was really great the first day and then it rained for two days. So, you know, it's been really hit and miss. So we... Um, are pivoting now that is getting colder and there's fewer events into doing the community presentations. And so we put together a list and we're going to make phone calls and go out and talk to folks. But in that conversation, it's kind of evolved where uh, the staff has, has been, and we haven't talked to Kira or Bridget about this yet, but we've started talking about how do we reach commercial folks who aren't reached by like the big commercial contractors like Honeywell, Johnson Controls, like not mom, mom and pop stuff or nonprofits or churches. And so what has evolved is, well, what if we, instead of going out and giving presentations to organizations, we had like a barn raising energy efficiency event, did some light bulbs and some water measures at the church or the nonprofit, and then try to recruit the people that are there to do the energy efficiency themselves because we'll recruit the volunteers that are at that organization. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how to leverage our energy and doing the community outreach into the most tangible results. Because right now we're counting where do we go, how many people show up, who signs up for home energy chats. And it hasn't been great. There, it has been uh, not as fruitful as I had hoped. Um, but being out there, getting the visibility, getting our feet on the ground, shaking hands has been really helpful and getting the lay of the land. And so in the next six months, the following year's contract, I think there'll definitely be some pivots um, to really focus in on um, some some different community groups and some commercial efforts. We've also kicked around like talking to tradespeople, but that's not really a fully cooked idea yet, but we need to get to the HVAC contractors. Otherwise, we'll never make our goal. Thank you. Good. I have one other, one other quick one. Um, you, you listed Duke Energy Progress as being one of the uh, important partners up front. I will say, you know, I sort of, I sometimes, uh, as Jamie knows, periodically sit in on one or two committees here. And my observation is that uh, the level of participation by Duke with the group has fallen off substantially uh, since the, the days of the uh, Energy Innovation Task Force, the predecessor to uh, to this. And I wonder if uh, this has been an issue or concern uh, for you all, or if I'm just mistaken, and there are uh, there's uh, and there's a participation and support in way uh, by Duke in ways that I'm unaware. Yes, we are also worried about this. When it was about stopping building a peaker plant, the goal was obvious. Now it's a little more diffuse, and I feel like that we've lost some attention. Um, I would really like to get folks that are involved in the carbon plan and involved into the integrated resource plan, the IRP, to be on our committees because they're the ones that are going to be making these large grid level decisions. <laughs> we had a <laughs> so Lindsay De Lindsay uh, Demay, she's the, she's the daughter of the president of Duke Energy. Uh, what's her their last name but anyway she's been volunteering with us on the ground so we set up this thing to go get a get a meeting with him and he's retiring so like you know sometimes you get a break and sometimes it's not as big of a break as you're hoping but um getting so we we've met one-on-one -on -one with duke um and we've met uh with the city and the county and now it's like okay well how do we dream together going forward so that we have this better shared vision to get duke to play more integrally into what we're doing Otherwise, I won't really work. The tier two uh, energy efficiency stuff for low income folks will definitely help with the cash and like getting more engagement. But as far as like policies and procedures and greening the grid, that's not that's not going to do it. Yeah. 
That's to say, I don't have a plan, but we um, gotta get we gotta get more people involved. Jamie, I'm Anna is blowing her nose and not feeling well, so I'm going to step in and say we have another presentation to go to and other questions that will follow. So we really probably need to move on. Sounds good. Thank Thanks. you very much for your presentation. Thanks, Jamie. Phyllis, you about ready to tee it up, I guess. I'm or, ready. Uh, Kira. And Kira, my signal to advance the slide is just going to be a good old. <laughs> okay. Sounds okay. appropriate. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks to Anna and Bridget for this opportunity to address SACI for now. Your name may be changing soon. Uh, and thank you for the important advice that you give our city council. Uh, thanks to Kira and Allison for help in preparing this presentation. My hope is for SACI to add sustaining pollinators and biodiversity to Asheville's sustainability priorities. I'm here today as the founder and director emerita of B-City USA and a board member of Asheville Greenworks. In my background, I was campaign director for Blue Ridge Forever uh, and I participated in uh, NEMAC's Community Resilience Assessment. I'm a graduate of Al Gore's Climate Reality Training, and I've served on a, a couple of Asheville commissions. I used to be the Director of Leadership Asheville. Those are just some highlights on, on who I am. Uh, we bring flowers to funerals. We carry bouquets at weddings. We use flowers as our table centerpieces, and we decorate our yards with them. But 100 million years ago or so, plants evolved colorful, fragrant flowers strictly to attract pollinators. We only appeared on the planet about five to seven million years ago. There are seven major groups of pollinators, beetles, bees, flies, moths, butterflies, hummingbirds, and bats. And that bat is not yellow, it's covered in pollen. Um, the colonists introduced honeybees to America, the Americas in the 1600s, but our native bees and other pollinators were already well established. They just didn't make honey or wax. The honeybees thrive because they're generalist feeders, unlike many of our pollinators that are specialist feeders. And there's 20,000 different species of bees in the world. Oh, uh, <clears throat> these lady sweat bees here have really packed a lot of pollen on their legs. It's the only source of protein for them. And that's what makes bees the most important pollinators in the temperate world. Pollen carries the plant species unique male DNA. And so that's why the plant needs the bees help. Bzz in 2016, nearly 100 scientists collaborated to advise nations on policies that would curb the rate of pollinator decline. And they concluded that 40% of insect pollinator species are at risk of extinction right now, including 28% of uh, our own 47 bumblebee species. Recognizing the urgency, we got busy and we created Bee City USA. And I'm so proud to say that in 2012, our very own city council unanimously passed the very first resolution in the nation. Our mission is galvanizing communities to sustain pollinators by increasing the abundance of native plants, providing nest sites, and reducing the use of pesticides. In 2015, we launched the sister program, Bee Campus USA, and there you can see a picture of UNCA. They're one of our Bee Campuses, along with Warren Wilson College and the North Carolina Arboretum. In 2017, we transferred responsibility for our local program from Public Works to Asheville Greenworks. And then um, in 2018, we merged Bee City USA into the national organization, the Xerces Society, with the largest pollinator conservation program in the world. In 2021, 
we're very happy to say that the Office of Sustainability became the sponsoring department for Asheville's VCD USA program, and Kira became our liaison. And so we've been celebrating our 10th anniversary all year long. Thanks to the Office of Sustainability for contracting with Greenworks to do some of this work. We're so lucky to have Greenworks leading Asheville's program. We have a leadership committee. We have events year round, including pollination celebration during National Pollinator Week in June. We have a garden certification program and we've already certified more than 150 gardens in our area. We have a, a species, a plant species list and supplier list for those plants. And we have many, many public gardens that we're working on. Um, and uh, you can see some of them on the French Broad River Greenway. The Xerxes Society has been doing a brilliant job of managing our national program since 2018. And today we have more than 320 B cities and campuses in 45 states and the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. They're all raising awareness and creating habitat to reverse pollinator declines. As we've evolved, the commitments affiliates make have also evolved. Our original focus was more on European honeybees, but we soon realized our native pollinators needed much more help. So when you compare the original commitments with our current commitments, we've taken out the beekeeping ordinance, we've allowed cities to delegate responsibility for managing their bee city program to a nonprofit like Asheville Greenworks, and we've added uh, the requirement that they create their plant and supplier list and create an integrated pest management plan and then integrate those plans into their master plans. Uh, you may have seen this article in the New York Times Magazine in 2018. It raised the question, what does the insect apocalypse mean for the rest of life on earth, including humans? A Whole Foods store in New Jersey worked with the Xerces Society to answer that question by showing the produce section with bees and without bees. We know that around 35% of our crops rely on pollinators for seed and fruit set, improved quality and or increased yield. Around 90% of flowering plant species rely on pollinators for reproduction, and most other species, including us, rely on those plants for food and shelter. 90% of terrestrial birds rely on butterfly and moth caterpillars for baby food. Can you imagine it takes five to 10,000 caterpillars to raise just one nest of chickadees? In other words, pollinators are keystone species. As the UN study reported, biodiversity equals global sustainability insurance. Less is not more, more is better. Greater species numbers and larger population sizes give ecosystems a better chance of survival in the face of climate change. Recognizing how critical native plants are to reversing pollinator declines, we updated the commitments to require locally native plant lists and integrate them into the city's master plans. We could not have had a better task force for our latest update for Asheville's Bee City plant list, which includes 282 species of wildflower shrubs, trees, bunch grasses, and vines. I want you to notice the column headings here. This is just a sample page. We have scientific and common names, when they flower, and maybe the most important column, the value, value to pollinators. We have local suppliers who are being very responsible with their, their pest management. But when we look at the city of Asheville's list, we find that of the trees and shrubs, more than 50% are non-natives and the ground covers and grasses, 70% are non-native. So we would welcome the opportunity to update the city's list for developers with native plants in mind. We're grateful that the city has committed to hiring an urban forester and updated the UDO to provide more tree protections. 
urban canopies not only sequester carbon and cool heat islands among uh, some, of the, some of the things they do, they also sustain pollinators. Green works and the Urban Forest Commission's work are important. We know because of recent research that female bees gather pollen from trees, even the wind pollinated ones, including pine trees, to supply vital protein to their developing young. We also know, thanks to more recent research, that male and female adult bees consume pollen from trees as well. The research is growing by leaps and bounds as the world realizes how severe pollinator decline is. Trees are literally meadows in the sky for pollinators. Thousands of species of pollinators are in, on, under our trees year round in various phases of their life cycles or migration. It's a myth that all pollinators need is pollinator gardens. The truth is wildflowers are essential, but pollinators need lots more than just wildflowers. Those meadows in the sky become warm blankets on the ground in winter. All kinds of creatures, including 94% of moths, overwinter and leaf litter in some stage of their life cycles. Think of all the pollinators that are killed each year when they are chopped up for mulch. Bzz. Even in death, trees support pollinators. Dead branches and tree snags provide nesting and overwintering habitat for beetles and bees, but when we've been, but we've been taught they should be hauled away and ground up along with those leaves because they're not tidy. Even more recently, we added the Integrated Pest Management Plan commitment. And this is a publication here, one of many, many, many publications that Xerces does uh, to support this effort to educate communities about pest management. That picture you see in the center of, is of our very own New Belgium brewery uh, landscape. The problem with pesticides, and when we're talking about pesticides, we're talking about insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides, is that most pesticides have lethal or sublethal impacts on insect pollinators, but only the honeybees are routinely tested for pesticide impacts. Pesticide manufacturing and use results in greenhouse gas emissions. And when you think about sourcing your plants, many growers use systemic pesticides that linger throughout the plant to harm feeding pollinators, extending even to the nectar and pollen. When you test honey, uh, when uh, labs test honey, they find lots and lots of pesticides in that honey. Herbicides for residential and institutional lawn and turf management harm pollinators, but only the state of California tracks non-agricultural use. Pest plants or insects often become resistant to pesticides, become super pest. Agricultural pesticides and mosquito barrier spraying kills or harms non-targeted insects. Pesticides are sometimes applied together and or they mix with other pesticides in the environment to create entirely new chemical toxins, but these combinations are not, are not tested on insects. Pesticides often leach into the soil, water, and air. 70% of bees actually nest in the ground, so it has a direct impact on our bees, but it also impacts all of us. Many, many pesticides are found in the umbilical cords of babies. You can see here the growth of our leading insecticide problem, the neonicotinoids. When it was introduced in the 1990s, and then uh, when you compare it when, uh, in 2014 in this graph, you can see that the growth has been explosive. And now US crops annually treated with neonics cover an area equivalent to the state of Texas annually. But we are using them for landscaping as well and nobody is measuring that impact. So um, to summarize, if Asheville wants sustainability and resilience, biodiversity is key. Nearly 90% of flowering plants rely on pollinators to reproduce. Plant diversity depends on pollinator diversity and vice versa. At least 
a quarter of 20,000 bee species specialize on very certain plant pollens, and most butterflies and moths have specific larval host plants. Native trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and bunch grasses support native pollinators, and they are well adapted to local conditions, often requiring less pampering than exotic species. So we could think green like this metallic green sweat bee. Conserving pollinators doesn't represent a large budget expenditure for Asheville. It's simply a matter of planning and education. Sometimes it's even less expensive than conventional landscaping. By contrast, not conserving pollinators is very costly due to the impacts on food security and the domino effect on the loss of other animal and plant species and intensification of climate change impacts as a result. The good news is that we have opportunities for safe habitat literally in our own backyards. Almost 50% of American landscape is in agriculture and most of the rest is developed. But urban and suburban areas have the same or more pollinator diversity than rural areas. Lawn and turf constitutes more than 40 million acres as of 2005 in the continental US and it's growing by 500,000 acres per year based on NASA uh, data. 75% or more of landscaping plants tend to be exotic, not native, which native pollinators generally don't recognize as food or habitat. So what if Asheville's landscapes were more pollinator friendly? And here's even more good news. Bee cities across America are proving we can change conventional landscaping paradigms. Opportunities for cost savings and increasing habitat abound. You can reduce lawns, and mowing frequency and expenses and energy emissions and increase healthy habitat. We can reduce yard waste collections like leaves and tree branches and increase healthy habitat. We can manage pests without pesticides. And my friends at Xerces have even already offered to help develop Asheville's IPM plan for free. With that, I'll close and invite questions either now because I know it's late or um, at my email, uh, beesneedflowers at gmail.com. Thanks, Kira. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Uh, uh, have you done anything along railroad uh, side embankments? I know that in Europe there's been some work, but uh, there's a stretch that comes through our community where they're planting grass. And it just seems to me that I've raised the issue, it does nothing for pollinators. And uh, they're pushing back that it's the easiest way to keep clear uh, because of, I guess, if, if they don't, the railroads will spray pesticides to keep it clear. But yet I bicycle along the railroads for miles on end and I see uh, that it's there's no grass on either side of it. Um, it's usually got vegetation. So I'm wondering if you have any experience along uh, railroad embankments. Is that Michael? It is. Okay. Michael, I love your question. And that's an area of great discussion and a lot of, lot of work that's already being done. Uh, if you expand that notion out to all rights of way along roadsides and just, you know, let your imagination go wild with utility lines, that sort of thing, um, it is a great opportunity for pollinator corridor habitat. And um, so there are a number of organizations in the country, including the Xerces Society, doing a lot of work with that. And some of our affiliates around the country are uh, on board definitely and are working with their DOTs doing uh, roadside work to get the DOT to mow less, especially during critical bloom times, for example. Mm. Uh, it's That's a, a huge opportunity. Outstanding. And by, I might just say quickly, <laughs> this is the most superb presentation I have heard or seen in many, many, many years. I just thank you so much. It's so illuminating. Oh, thank you. It's always hard to be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? 
I have another one if others don't. Um, you, the, the another issue that's coming up in my uh, interaction with landscape uh, architects is that they're saying uh, that native pollinators are now facing problems with uh, climate variation. And so the question is, when do you think about uh, bringing in other than native pollinators, given the uh, climate variability? Wondering if you, how you address that. That's a huge issue of research. And, and we know that um, the phenology is uh, really wreaking havoc. Uh, the plants are blooming at different times than the the pollinators are emerging. That's a, a fear we have. And when you look at that statistic about the bumblebees, they can handle cooler climates and they come out earlier in the morning and, and uh, work later in the day than honeybees, for example. Uh, so they are a real uh, bellwether for what's happening with climate change. Um, so we don't really know. I mean, it's all over the map and scientists around the world are, are dealing with that question. We know that the protein content of um, many, many flowers uh, seems to be reducing as an impact of climate change um, uh, in the pollen. So um, it's, it's a, just a huge question, but in terms of introducing new pollinators, um, to try to keep up with the changing climate. I don't think anybody's suggesting that yet. We're just trying to hang on as many of our pollinators as we can. And if we support them by providing the native plants that they're accustomed to and that they co-evolve with over millions of years, that's our best shot. Great, thank you. Steve, you had a question? Yeah, uh, Phyllis, I, I too want to add uh, my many thanks for a great presentation and for your patience in waiting through uh, all that came before uh, to give it. Um, um, I, uh, I should disclose that I have a personal interest in this matter. My wife and I recently, this spring, uh, be, uh, qualified our garden to become a certified pollinator habitat. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, happy to do that. And uh when you say, every time you say buzz, though, I worried about getting stung, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. So uh, um, my my only, uh, I have two questions. One is where can you get more information about the integrated pollinator plan? And two is, in general, is there anything that occurs to you uh, that the city of Asheville can be, uh, should be anything more that the city should be doing at this point? Well, thank you for that question, Steve. And um, but as I say, we're grateful to uh, the Office of Sustainability for uh, giving Greenworks a contract to do some of this work. Of course, it doesn't pay for all of the work that we're doing at Greenworks. But um, we would love to see the city of Asheville come up to speed with the new commitments that other affiliates are making across the world to include an IPM plan and to adopt uh, the native plant list or some version of that uh, as the city. And so uh, we, we continue to hope that the city will become interested in developing an IPM plan. That would be huge. And then the city could model the behavior that they want the rest of the community to use on their own city-owned property if that were uh, to happen. Thank you. Thanks again. I have a quick question, Phyllis. Um, what is the reason, as far as you know, that protein content in pollen would be going down due to uh, climate change? Is that because they're stressed and they can't store as much or what? what's the deal? They don't know. This came out of some study in Asia and I was at the International Pollinator Conference at UC Davis when the scientists announced that. So. It's a really new area of research, um, but it has something to do with the plants being under stress, definitely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any more questions for Phyllis? Thank you so much, Phyllis. That was very informative, great presentation. Thank you, and I sure hope that uh, as Stacy looks at the broader issue of sustainability that you will add the commitments that the city of Asheville made uh, when it adopted that BCDUSA resolution 
to Stacy's priorities as well. Thanks, Anna. Great point. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. All right, that brings us to our last item on the agenda, public comment. Kara, did we get any other public comment during our meeting? No public comments. All right. Well, um, with that, we can adjourn. I hope to see you all at the December um, holiday get together. Um, details on that, I think, have already been sent out via a calendar invite. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Feel better, Anna. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.